The Lord is King, the Most High over all the earth. And I hope you know that we really mean that. The psalm doesn't say the Lord is our King, or the Lord is King if you accept Him. It says the Lord is King over all the earth. And I think we might have an American freedom filter in our brains that doesn't let us register what that really means for us. We're taught from birth not to impose our beliefs on other people. Not bad, but we, too, we go too far, allowing this to filter our own convictions out of our own lives. We even extend it to morality. If you ask a room full of Americans whether or not the statement, lying is wrong, is a fact or an opinion, you'll usually get the answer that it's an opinion, even if they're all Christians. Because some alarm bell goes off in our heads that says, ah, moral thing, that must be an opinion, a belief. But saying something like lying is wrong or murder is wrong is not an opinion. It is a moral fact, one most people actually believe. We've been trained to only see certain kinds of things as factual. Yet there are many different kinds of facts, scientific, historical, mathematical, and yes, moral. And there's even the deeper category that you could call philosophical, metaphysical, religious. Catholics don't just believe there is one God for us. There is one God, period. Historical fact, metaphysical fact. Just because a lot of people don't believe it doesn't change it. People don't believe we landed on the moon or that the earth is round. Yet what people believe doesn't change a fact. And what others believe should not stop you from treating the facts as facts, certainly not in your own mind. Which brings us to this, the Lord is king of all the earth. Whether you voted for Biden, Trump, or someone else, the Lord is king. Whether you're an anarchist, Buddhist, a communist, Wiccan, or democratic atheist, God is your king. And if you do know that, you shouldn't pretend you don't, even as you respect the freedom of those who don't. So no, I am not saying we go around forcing non-believers to bow down to the God we know is king. But it is one thing to respect the freedom of another person. It is another to confuse that with refusing to assert facts at all. It's possible and necessary to be able to say both, that it is a fact that Jesus rose from the dead, and I won't force people to believe it. In practice, we do this all the time. There are some things that even if you know them to be true, you don't force people to accept, even as you admit it's not an opinion, it's a fact. It's usually not worth it to hassle people about the moon landing. You know the facts, but for most people, it's not a big deal to let it go. There are facts, however, that require you to act on them, whether people around you like it or not. Mixing certain cleaners can create a poisonous gas. If someone in the house doesn't believe your explanation, you still knock the bottles out of their hands to prevent them from killing you both. What does that have to do with today's Feast of Transfiguration? It's about what we do with the truth in our own minds and with others. The entire second reading from St. Peter is an eyewitness report. Peter laying out the historical facts. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. It's like he's saying, this whole Christian religion thing is not a myth. It's not options on a menu. It's not a choose-your-own-belief. It's fact. Jesus lived and died and rose from the dead. We saw it happen, and this one time, he showed us he was king on the mountain. And then the gospel gives us the full report. The details are interesting. First, we are told that only Peter, James, and John are brought up the mountain by themselves. Despite the fact that he is the Son of God, he only reveals his glory to three other people in this moment. The other apostles aren't even included. And this tells us something important, that there is a time and a place 
for revealing certain things to certain people. Just as we don't teach calculus to a four-year-old, and we don't berate atheists about the finer points of the hypostatic union, people need to be prepared, disposed, before you can present certain truths to them. And so if you do want others to believe what you know is true, and you should want that, you'll need patience to help them up the mountain to be ready, and also enough conviction to not put it off until it's too late. Secondly, Jesus doesn't let these three stay on the mountain. After experiencing this profound truth in all of its glory, Peter, James, and John are forced to return to the mundane world. And now they are in the position of living with this experience, this truth, despite being surrounded by people completely oblivious to it. We cannot deny to ourselves what we know to be true, but we also have to avoid resenting the fact that others don't know, even our fellow Catholics. And just as Jesus sets the timeline for Peter, James, and John to eventually reveal this glory, we have to cooperate in Jesus' plan for saving souls. His timing, not our own. Which brings us to the third, final, and most important point. The Father's voice uses the present tense and tells us to listen to him. It's an ongoing thing. If we want to know the truth, and we want to know when and how to share the truth, then we need to be constantly listening to Jesus Christ. How? You know how. I say it all the time. Peter even tells us here to be attentive to the prophetic message, a lamp shining in a dark place. That prophetic message is the gospel found in scripture and tradition. Read your Bible and your catechism. Frequent the sacraments. Spend real time in private prayer, not just an Our Father and be done with it. Real prayer. These things are the lamp in the darkness of our world amongst the lies of our culture. The darkness is very dark. The world doesn't just reject Jesus Christ, it rejects the idea of God. It rejects not just God's plan for humanity, but the very meaning of what it is to be human. And in the name of tolerance, we are told not to impose our opinions. But they aren't just opinions. They are the facts. And some of these facts, some of these truths, are matters of life and death and more. We cannot force people to be Christians. But sometimes we can and should force them to be human to stop them mutilating children, robbing the poor, and killing the innocent. No, we cannot and should not force people to believe in Jesus, but if you can't stand for the truth when it affects the life you can see, what makes you think you stand for the life you can't see? Faith without freedom isn't real faith, but if you treat your own faith in your own head like it's just another opinion, it is not a faith worth sharing. Christian faith isn't an opinion, an option on a menu. It is a supernatural conviction of the truth, a genuine trust in the God who is truth. Others might think it's just your opinion, but you have to know in your own mind and heart that your faith is either true or it's nothing. And how you live will prove it.